Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode is concerned with representing ancient cultures in archaeology. By the end of this episode, you will be familiar with how ancient cultures are studied and defined through their archaeological remains. You can work with the standard terminology and conventions about archaeological cultures, and you should be able to evaluate the representations in different cases. Archaeology books and museum exhibits routinely refer to ancient time periods or groups of people as Paleolithic, Neolithic, or other categories. All around the world, you will see this kind of terminology, as well as other terms that apply only in specific regions. The extensive and inconsistent jargon tends to obstruct the learning process and the ability to communicate basic information. This presentation will help toward making sense of what this terminology means and how it potentially can facilitate studies and discussions of the past. We can begin with remembering the classical outline of a three-aged system of stone, bronze, and iron ages. In the deeper, older layers beneath the ground, stone tools were the most popular. Later, bronze became more popular than stone, and then eventually iron became more popular than both stone and bronze. This three-aged system was developed more than 150 years ago in Denmark, where it had worked well within the local archaeological record. Importantly, the three general ages were confirmed through stratigraphic excavations. A similar basic outline has been documented in most parts of Europe and in other regions of the world, but the details, of course, have been different in each place. The exact years can be different cross-regionally in the transitions from stone to bronze to iron ages. Furthermore, the ancient time periods in some places do not match with these classic three ages, and instead they could be described in different terminology according to the local findings. Since the 1860s, a major conceptual contribution emerged from the work of John Lubbock, who looked more closely at the Stone Age and discerned more about its internal chronology. Lubbock proposed an Old Stone Age or Paleolithic period of hunter-gatherers, followed later by a New Stone Age or Neolithic period of farmers. Following Lubbock's outline, other archaeologists over the years have added more detail of the material culture contents from stratigraphic layers in chronological order. The results naturally have confirmed that artifacts and other material indicators indeed have changed through time. When we describe the material inventories of each time period, then essentially we are describing the durable material remnants of real people who once lived in the past. We can consider how these records might reflect portions of the cultural groups or societies that once had existed. These basic concepts allowed Vere Gordon Child and others to formalize the academic thoughts about archaeological cultures. The core idea here is about defining ancient cultures on the basis of their archaeological signatures, while acknowledging that of course the surviving material reflections are incomplete approximations of the original living cultural groups. Each definition of an archaeological culture needs to correspond with a measured geographic area and time period. We all should know that artifact assemblages have been different from one region to another, as well as changing through time. In this case, the work of defining an archaeological culture needs to correspond with the measured parameters of the material assemblage in question. Accordingly, we can see different definitions all around the world. In a global view of world archaeology, you can notice some of the generalities of how cultural groups have changed through time. 
These generalities sometimes are portrayed as grand narratives of cultural history, but realistically they should be understood as schematic frames of reference for navigating through the diverse archaeological sequences of the world. In each region, you can study a unique cultural history, and you should be able to compare with the larger generalized schematic of a world archaeology. When studying these different cultural periods and terminologies, we need to be aware of how they were defined in the first place. What material findings of artifacts, food remains, or other evidence were discovered in each dated stratigraphic layer, and did those findings offer distinctive signatures of coherent cultural groups? We most confidently can describe the technologies and perhaps the economies of past cultural groups, but we need to engage in more interpretive work for assessing past social functioning politics, or other aspects of ancient life that are not directly observable in the archaeological records. Depending on what is found in a given location, the archaeological assemblages from each time period conceivably could be labeled as belonging to an archaeological culture, potentially using some of the standard terminology in the conventional worldwide schematics. At this point in the presentation, I would like to offer two examples of museum exhibits that guide visitors through archaeological assemblages as reflections of past cultures. First, we can look at the permanent exhibit in the National Museum of Denmark. I will not review every detail here, but you should be able to see the key points of the exhibit's organization. The archaeological findings are presented in chronological order, beginning with the oldest evidence of the region. The materials are described in simple words of what they are and with minimal interpretation. In each individual display, you can see multiple examples of the artifacts that are being described for a specific time period. You can see the variations in the shapes and styles of harpoon points, stone tools, pottery traditions, and more. As you walk through the rooms of the exhibit, you can follow the chronological order of how the artifacts change through the sequence of the Paleolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and other distinctions. The second museum example looks at the National Museum of South Korea. The exhibit follows a familiar chronological order, but here I will show just one small portion. The exhibit makes an effort to illustrate the contexts of how the artifacts actually were used in the past. For instance, you can see how numerous stone flakes were removed from a raw material core, in total creating the debris of tool manufacture. This display effectively conveys more information than you would see in a collection of finished stone tools or discarded flakes. As for the finished stone artifacts, you can see approximations of how they were used in real life. Certain forms of sharpened stone points likely had been fixed at the ends of wooden sticks with tanged attachments for this purpose. Other forms of shaped and grooved pebbles likely had been used as weights in fishing nets. In some cases, artifacts were made of composite parts, such as specialized fishing hooks made with shaft pieces and point pieces that originally had functioned together. You can see how stone grinding surfaces, handheld tools, and preserved plant foods all had interrelated in ancient food processing activities. Throughout this exhibit, you can gain a sense of the cultural actions and contexts that were responsible for creating the individual pieces of artifacts. You can appreciate those artifacts in their own right, but furthermore you can learn about the past cultures. In many museum exhibits and book summaries, you can see narratives of what happened in the past. In these cases, you should keep in mind about two fundamental questions. First. What is the material evidence in support of defining the archaeological cultures? Second, what are the logical links between the material data and any proposed interpretations? 
These basic descriptions of archaeological cultures supply the substantive primary data for pursuing all other questions in archaeology. With these foundational frameworks, you can explore questions about chronological change through time, or about the functioning of a society within a measurable time period. The more you know about the fundamental contents and parameters of the archaeological record, the better equipped you can be to develop meaningful questions and to test those questions with real data. In concluding this episode, now you should be prepared to discuss how archaeological cultures are studied. Whenever you encounter a reference to an archaeological culture, then you should be able to evaluate the basis for its definition. Furthermore, you can consider how to improve those definitions and work toward addressing other research questions. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studio.